Welcome back, everyone. And uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Welcome Wilson, who is also a member of the Trellis Foundation Board, as well as the Trump Trellis Company Board, to introduce our next panel. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Welcome Wilson, Jr. Uh, higher education has been of particular interest of mine over the years. Through my involvement both with Trellis Foundation, Trellis Company, the Board of Regents of the University of Houston System, and now the Higher Education Coordinating Board, I truly appreciate the value of strong leadership and policy in fostering student success. I would like to break for just a second and introduce uh, Kelly Kisnick uh, with Senator Larry Taylor's office. Uh, Senator Taylor is the chair of the Senate Committee on Education. So welcome, uh, Kelly, to this forum. In Texas, we are fortunate that our workforce, higher education, and K through 12 agencies are working together in unprecedented ways to help students find and follow a path that leads to a meaningful career and a fulfilling life. The next section of our program will explore the current successes and challenges of the agency's collaborative work. To that end, it is my pleasure to introduce our next panel. Uh, Mr. Brian Daniel serves as chairman of the Texas Workforce Commission, working to implement customized services to meet the needs of Texas' vast array of industries and advance the development of strong and competitive workforce. Prior to joining TWC, uh, Brian served as executive director of the Governor's Economic Development Division. Uh, next, Dr. Harrison Keller, Commissioner of Higher Education, has served the State of Texas at Higher Education Coordinating Board since 2019. Dr. Keller came to the Coordinating Board from the University of Texas at Austin, where he was deputy to the President for Strategy and Policy and a Professor of Practice. In addition to other faculty appointments over the years, Dr. Keller also served as Director of Research for the Texas House of Representatives and Senior Education Advisor for the Speaker of the House. And finally, Mr. Mike Morath is the Texas Commissioner of Education at the Texas Education Agency, overseeing pre-K through high school education for more than five and a half million students enrolled in both traditional public and charter schools. Prior to becoming the state's education commissioner, Mike served on the Dallas Independent School District Board of Trustees for more than four years. Under his leadership, ISDs are now beginning to track college, career, and military readiness outcomes for students across the state, data that will continue to inform this work well into the future. Please join me in welcoming our commissioners to join Evan Smith on stage. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thank you. Welcome. That was a hell of a basketball game last night, wasn't it? You know, I'm just saying. Yeah. <laughs> it's always good to have somebody associated with a winning team as the person introducing you. Um, welcome, commissioners, the chairman. Nice to see you. I thought we would start by doing a well check on each of your agencies, um, or at least the areas of your responsibility, authority, and expertise here at the end of these uh, two years. Commissioner Morath, how has public education in Texas high level weathered the last two years? I realize there's probably not one answer. We were talking in the last session, if you've seen one ISD, you've seen one ISD, I get that. But generally speaking, how's public ed doing? The, uh, I'll answer it in sort of two ways. So how are the students doing and how are, they, um, uh, how are we supporting them institutionally? So the students um, have not fared well. The uh, degree of the challenge, the degree of, of the impact of the disruption, I do not think that we yet have fully uh, grasped, the collective we have fully grasped. There's a 15 percentage point decline in um, uh, proficiency in mathematics across the board. That, one five, 15 uh, one, percent. One five. Yeah. Uh, so that's 800,000 more students who are below grade level uh, than uh, before this, the pandemic hit. Um, uh, similar decline, but not as steep in um, literacy. Yep. And um, you know, there's a lot of wailing and gnashing of teeth about the nature of standardized tests and their, their appropriate role and this sort of thing, but we, we do know their value. We know what they um, tell us. We know what they're predictive. We got a lot of data that tells us that. And so if you 
translate the decline in mathematics proficiency in particular to the likely impact that it has on lifetime earnings. Um, uh, the five and a half million souls that are in Texas public schools will see a 6% reduction in their lifetime earnings. So um, think of how much money you make this year, um, how much money you made last year, the money you make uh, the year after that, um, and take 6% off the top. And uh, that's what has happened. Uh, we know with certainty that, that that is what has happened, as much certainty as we can predict the future. That's uh, the equivalent of $2 trillion worth of income that we have taken out of the pockets of all of our children. Is there nothing you can do about that? I mean, obviously, you can't go backwards in time. But the assumption is, is that you're going to build back. And it may not take two years. It may take longer. But can you reclaim some of that? Yeah, so uh, we are doing everything that we can possibly think of with the, every amount of managerial sophistication that we can muster. Um, uh, there's $20 billion of resources that have been added to the system. That's two zero b with a B. Um, yeah. That is not a small amount of resources that were added to the system. Um, investments, strategic investments in terms of, of operationalizing around talent support, around uh, content, uh, good first instruction, good interventions uh, supports, um, and then giving kids more of both. Um, uh, these are the, uh, the, the thrusts of the work that we're engaged in, uh, and we will have to be successful for that um, future not to come to pass. Um, but, you know, history is useful to study for a variety of reasons, and every large-scale intervention like this that has ever been, uh, every yeah. large-scale disruption that has ever been studied yeah. um, has not resulted in um, uh, effective uh, repair. Um, so we would be the first. Um, and and uh, we are going to uh, throw everything at it that we can. The legislature has been dialed in on this. Our team's been dialed in on this. Superintendents, principals, teachers all over the state are as focused on it as possible. But, I mean, for those of you who aren't educators but who might be parents, um, molding eager young minds is a complicated um, uh, enterprise. I appreciate that you're not sugarcoating it, and I would also agree with you that we think we know, but it's a little bit like that scene in Jurassic Park where you're standing so close to the dinosaur that you really can't see the dinosaur. Yeah. You have to be much farther back. We're not far back enough yet to see the totality of what we're confronting here. Right? Yeah, and, and one of the things is you don't know an alternative future. What would have been the future of all of these children had the pandemic not happened? Can't go back um, in time. Uh, so we'll live the lives that we're living. We right. are... Um, the, the nature of the, um, sp the speed with which we are implementing reforms, yeah. operationalizing reforms across 1,200 school systems, 700,000 public school employees, it's unprecedented. And you know, we're blessed. We've got a lot of strong leaders in Texas um, uh, all over the state. Yep. But um, our kids need us to be the absolute best versions of ourselves, and um, uh, we're, we're trying to be. Commissioner Keller, let me ask the same question of you about higher ed. We've talked about this. I do not have kids in K-12. I do have a son in a public university in Texas, and he entered in the fall of 2019. He has had a total of one semester of what I would describe as normal college. Um, he's never going to get that time back, back to the question of, of what the last years have meant. Um, what are you hearing from your campuses? What are you hearing from college leaders? Uh, four years, two years, about the impact of the last two years? Yeah, so, so I would echo some of the same points that Mike made. Like, it's hard to overstate the, the nature of the disruption that our colleges and universities experience. So I've been, I, I've been telling everybody, this is the largest disruption we've seen since the Second World War uh, in the operations of colleges and universities. I put enormous pressure on them. Um, and we saw simultaneous collapse of multiple revenue streams uh, from their housing contracts, their food service, their events. Their, uh, uh, we uh, also, uh, for the students, um, it, it was incredibly disruptive as uh, classes suddenly had to shift to sort of emergency online instruction, yeah. as, as you point out. Um, not all of that was great. Um, uh, it, it, so there, there have been some silver linings with important innovations around digital learning and that kind of thing. But overall, at scale, um, there, there's a lot that was lost um, in, in that uh, conversion. Do you, do you have a statistic comparable to what I'm sort of still sitting here rolling around that 15 percent yeah. number and then the corresponding calculation about lost income over time? I'm rolling around in my head those stats kind of marveling at that, not in a good way. Yeah. Do you have a corresponding metric? 
that you can offer some I, i'll tell you the one to quantify the loss uh, the one that uh keeps me up at night the most is that i'm worried about our community colleges um so uh overall our universities our uh their enrollments are up over the where they were pre-pandemic our private universities are up um the tstcs are up considerably uh but community colleges are down uh, they were down 10% from uh, 19 to 20, and then they were hoping that enrollments would start to rebound. They went down another percent and a half, so they're down by about 11 and a half percent. So that's about 85,000 students. To what and, do you attribute that specifically? Well, uh, well, two, there's two things. So one is the community colleges historically, their enrollments tend to track more with what's happening in local labor, labor markets. So as the economies come roaring back, um, then where, where do we see uh, the, these students going? It looks like they're working. We've seen a bump in the uh, labor market participation. Now, normally we think of, of that as a good thing, uh, but if students are trading um, the, uh, college and, uh, and training beyond high school uh, for a short-term, low-wage, low-mobility job, then that creates a vulnerability for the students. It creates a vulnerability for our communities, for the state as a whole. So yeah. that, that's the metric that makes me worried because we saw the pandemic accelerated these trends that were already underway in our right. economy. But Brian will talk about this. So almost all the net new jobs we're creating, you need training beyond high school. Yet in our community colleges in particular that are right there on the front lines of what's happening in our local economies, we see enrollments are right. sharply down. Right. I, I do want to go to Chairman Daniel because you're bringing up the labor market and all that, but before, I, I want to just ask both Commissioner Marath and, and, and Commissioner Keller quickly. We had uh, disparities in outcomes in communities of color in public ed and higher ed pre-pandemic. All the conversation during the last two years has been that those disparities, Commissioner Marath, have accelerated. So that when you talk about learning loss, you talk about the things that we'll never be able to get back over these two years, the black and brown communities in the state particularly have had it worse, and there's a bigger hole to dig out of, correct? Uh, I mean, the short version is yes. I'll give you an illustrative example. So the yeah. Rio Grande Valley, we, have, we think about the state in 20 regions, or sort of, that's how TEA sort of organizes its right. view of the um, state, and so Rio Grande Valley is one of our regions. Um, they had the highest mathematics proficiency in the state uh, before the pandemic hit, which a lot of people don't really realize. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, the student population in the Rio Grande Valley is 99% Hispanic, 90, uh, at least 95% Hispanic, um, uh, and a, um, a fairly uh, large concentration of uh, students who are eligible for the free reduced lunch program. But anyways, at pre-pandemic, uh, highest mathematics proficiency in the state of Texas. So it was the, it's been the shining star for us. Yep. Uh, they have the worst mathematics proficiency in the state of Texas. They went from, from first, first to worst. To, to last, yeah, yeah um, because of the nature of the disruption. So, you know, Texas, I think we fared vastly better than a large number of states. We made several policy decisions that weren't right. necessarily popular, but um, have proven to be the right thing to do to force schools to be open. We, our schools were open throughout the pandemic. I had friends in Maryland, D.C., New York, didn't, didn't really have that well, choice. Well, you, you know, we talked about this before. I had three superintendents on stage in Dallas yesterday morning, Dallas, Fort Worth, and Richardson tried to get them to say nice things about you. I appreciate that. I tried. Um, but, but they acknowledged that having the schools open, they said, well, we don't agree with the governor, but thank God we were forced to have the schools open because it would be a disaster if we didn't reopen the school. I mean, they even acknowledged that that yeah, was well, a I, uh, uh, As we were going through that, I just shared a little personal vignette on this. We're, we're going through this decision-making process pretty early on. Um, um, one of our, uh, we, again, we have a lot of uh, really skilled leaders around the state. Yeah. So one of the superintendents from um, the Rio Grande Valley calls me. And um, he's uh, very emotional, um, but he's, it's, this is a, he's a solid, uh, is, is, is as good a leader as kids could ever hope for. He's a phenomenal man. Um, and uh, he said, uh, one of our girls committed suicide. One of the girls in the school district, um, a 16-year-old, had, had a bad breakup, um, committed suicide. And he says, I don't, you know, you don't know the what ifs, but what would have been true if she had been in school, if we'd been able to lay hands on her, if we'd been able to, to, to create the supports uh, that we know that we can provide? And so, uh, again, I think about the nature of this disruption that has been unleashed yeah. on all of us in America, and 
um, uh, we, we have um, very significant um, challenges to face, but we're likely better off than a lot yeah. of other places in America. L let me actually, Commissioner, go to Chairman Daniel, if you don't mind. I mean, I, I want to not leave him out of this, and the conversation around the economy is important. Chairman, the Workforce Commission really had its work cut out for it over the last two years. We talked about this in the last session. We went from the record low of 3.4% in May of 2019, um, that was 10 months before the pandemic took hold of us. Then we go to 12.9% in April of 2020, the record high in Texas. And now we're back to 4.8%, which is not all the way back to the... So is everything, in your mind, are we, are we back? Are we back? Yes. We're, we're back in terms of net numbers and the state. If you really start looking in November of 2021, that was the month we had net recovered all the jobs lost during the pandemic. In fact, in November of 2021, we set a record for the most number of Texans in payroll jobs, meaning they were working for wages. Right. We set a record in December. We set a record in January. And we announced about two hours ago that we set a record in February. The, the unemployment rate is now 4.7%. We have fewer people on unemployment benefits today than we did in late 19, early 2020, pre-pandemic. Right. Um, but we have more people saying that they're unemployed and looking for work, and we have about somewhere between six and 800,000 open jobs in the state. How so, do you square all that? That, that? that seems contradictory to me. I think we've seen companies, uh, they started creating jobs as early as uh, July 2020, and they, they've continued that month-over-month -month job right. growth with the exception of one. I think companies saw the need to continue to, to, if not grow, but sustain their operations. I think, though, that the pandemic created situations where people had to reevaluate their working um, life. For example, um, Commissioner Keller brings up a good point about community colleges enrollments being down. Everything's on a continuum, nothing's in a vacuum. Yeah. People tend to work hospitality sector jobs when they're pursuing school or something because the scheduling's more flexible. If you're not in school, you don't want to work evenings, you get a daytime job for different wages. So we've seen a great movement of employees through the workforce, particularly at, at kind of the, the low-skilled entry-level point. They've moved up in the workforce. That's usually a pretty good situation because we're graduating you know, 300, 325,000 students a year. Uh, people are moving into the workforce. But with, with everybody kind of realigning their job over the last 12, 16 months and companies continuing to create, I mean, we're, we're well up over you know, 100,000, nearly 100,000 in the last two months, new jobs created. It, it just creates this short-term kind of situation where people are evaluating it's like going to Luby's hungry. You know, it's, it's hard to make a decision at the line, and so they're evaluating a lot of options. We saw a lot of creative employment during the pandemic. People became comfortable with working multiple jobs, multiple part-time jobs, because that's what they were able to do. Yeah. And I think, I think all of that's kind of sorting back out. The economists will tell you the, the jobs market looks good and the strength has returned. The curve line is, is right where it was in 16, 17, 18, 19. Uh, what we're seeing, though, at the hiring level, you've got some wage inflation, you've got jobs that are kind of geographically distributed in, in an interesting kind of way, and you've got people evaluating all of their options and trying right. to figure out where to plug in. Isn't it also the case, though, I mean, this may be more anecdotal than something I can prove to you, but I feel it in my bones that one of the things that happened over the last few years is that rich got richer and the poor got poorer, that the gulf between people at the top and people on the bottom really did widen in the last two years? What we saw th uh, that would really speak to that is, is that people who had a, a baccalaureate degree or higher, uh, about 3% of that population was on unemployment benefits relative to the pandemic. And people who had no post high school training were in the 70th percentile in terms of 70% of that population was on unemployment benefits. You know, I, 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 don't, I haven't really evaluated in terms of, of who made more or who made right. less, but what I'm saying is, is when well, we look at educational att attainment right. and the jobs that that provides, right. you are much more protected from events yep. like the pandemic economically if you have yeah. some training post high school. And there, ladies and gentlemen, is the soundbite on the value of higher education. Good night. That's it, right? I mean, seriously, you can't make more of a correlation than you just made, right? I would agree. Yeah. 
Um, so I want to talk about this tri-agency work, which is really the basis for this conversation, and it is about the three of you and your entities collaborating. I want to understand how the pieces of the puzzle fit together. Commissioner Morath, what do you need from Commissioner Keller and Higher Ed to succeed at what you do? So there's, I mean, there's several points of alignment, actually, not just between us and the coordinating order, but also between us and the Workforce Commission. So yeah, I, we'll come to that, but I, I want to um, specifically, be, you know, look, no less an authority on higher ed than the lieutenant governor decided this week just to collapse the two of you into the same bucket. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's not inconsistent with the governor's uh, tri-agency charge initially. The, no, no, the, I don't think it's inconsistent, but I do think that given the amount of money we're spending on higher ed in the state to all of a sudden relegate Commissioner Keller and higher ed to a subcommittee is interesting. Well, I, I, again, I, uh, when I think about the need to align um, uh, between K-12 higher ed and the Workforce Commission, it yeah. is, it's a valuable exercise. Okay. So the um, one aspect of work where the, our two agencies and, in fact, the two certain institutions um, uh, of public education and higher education uh, work in very close collaboration is in um, uh, models of high school that look like an early college high school mm -hmm. or P-TECH. Um, and so the, the idea here, uh, reflect on your high school experience for a moment. Remember your 17-year-old self uh, and all the wisdom that you had as a 17-year-old. Um, and um, uh, what did your senior year of high school look like? Um, uh, was it um, a situation where you were able to coast, where um, uh, life was uh, fairly easy? Hanging out in uh, the senior lot. That, that's right. right. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, dare I say, cruising for chicks. Um, uh, that um, uh, at least that happened when I was then. So the the. Um, uh, when I think about what we are doing now um, in collaboration with the coordinating board, the high school experience is being made vastly more rigorous and relevant to what will come next for our kids. So um, by the time that you graduate high school, right. um, why not have a huge uh, amount of uh, college under your belt? Um, uh, so we've, we've seen... Uh, We've gone from about 1,500 kids a year graduating high school with an associate's degree to more like 6,000 kids a year graduating with an associate's so, degree. So a questioner earlier in the day at a different panel talked about K to 14, which I hadn't heard before as an expression, but I'm going to borrow that now. That's, in fact, what you're talking about, where basically you finish two years of college, ideally in high yeah, school. Yeah, by, by 20 years of age, why not have a bachelor's degree? Um, right. uh, why not have an associate's degree that um, you finish before you okay. um, finish high school? And not just the right. general studies, but have it, this right. is where, again, you talk about alignment between all three of us, um, have it trade aligned. Um, I had three years of computer science and a year of typing at Garland High School, uh, worth literally millions of dollars to me, that, 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 so that this kind of embedding right. these um, rigorous liberal arts experience, rigorous trade experience, far beyond what would normally be assumed if you had this vision of like the high school experience right. in the 1980s, like vastly more um, uh, preparatory for, to ensure that our uh, kids coming out of high school are prepared to make, you know, to, to live a life of productivity that they can take care of themselves and their families. All. Right, so that's what you need from him. What do you, what is, what do you need from him? Uh, well, well, let me say two things. First of all, um, uh, I, I think I want to start by underlining an important point that uh, we need to blur the line, you know, and so, uh, like just this week, we released an updated um, uh, strategic plan for state higher education. So an update of the 60 by 30 Texas plan that we're calling Building a Talent Strong Texas. Uh, one of the important markers that we put down is that uh, we set ambitious attainment goals for degrees, uh, certificates, and other credentials of value that could be short-term credentials, uh, could be uh, industry-recognized uh, credentials, could be skilled apprenticeships but conditioned on this notion of, of value. So yep. we're the first state to put that marker down. So, um, so a lot of our conversations over the last uh, uh, several months um, have been uh, across the three agencies, how we align the ways that we track what kinds of credentials Texans earn, how that relates to what we see happening in the labor market, um, what that might imply for the next round of what happens in career and technology, education and high schools, and, uh, and then how do we count uh, uh, those credentials, connect into our wage data to power new kinds of advising tools for students and families and for the institutions themselves. Mm -hmm. So, um, so th that, that kind of blurring the line so that like, 
I, I've been around in some of the discussions about high school reform and early college high schools and stuff like that, and look, this original hope that all these kids were gonna get associate's degrees by the time they graduated from high school and get bachelor's degrees in two years has not panned out. Uh, we had about 54, 5,500 kids uh, earn associate's degrees while they were in high school. Um, I, think, I think we could do better with that, clearly. There's room for improvement. However, what I'm even more excited about is when I see uh, community colleges doing two things. One is pulling the, the guided pathways work down into their work with dual credit. So you don't just have kids taking a bunch of random dual credit courses, but they're taking courses that they're already on a pathway that could lead to an associate's degree or other kind of credential before they're in high school. The other thing is where, uh, just to pick up on the, on the point about PTEX, so that can include a wide range of industry recognized credentials, right? So I know like we're here at Austin Community College where you know, we were just in a, a, a pretty in-depth discussion with Richard's team the other day about how they've carefully mapped all their uh, continuing education workforce to their four credit workforce and how that can stack to associ associate's degrees and that kind of thing. So we need that kind of work to start earlier. We need to do a much better job of engaging talented students earlier so mm -hmm. they're on a path and not try to just like shoehorn all these innovations in post-secondary education into essentially a very traditional high school model. I drop my son off at high school every day. It looks exactly like the high school his great grandmother went to uh, just with more technology. And, and so, you know, I think, I think where we need to go is where there's a much more kind of flexible yep. uh, and, and more porous model. Now, let me say, the other thing I need from Mike and, and from Brian is partnership. And let me tell you what, I get that in spades. I, can, I texted Mike the other day about, hey, we're working on this implementation of an early high school graduation option that uh, was one of Chairman Creighton's bills that we passed. Um, he texted me back, I think within five minutes, we got our teams together. We've got draft rules coming to our board uh, in July. So I there mean, is really a there is really a line. Uh, yeah, and and right. and I mean that's not the kind of thing that you legislate. That's the kind of thing that just the right. partnership across the agencies, down into our teams, is something yeah. that's just invaluable. So Chairman Daniel, what do you need from the two of them? Because obviously they're the inputs into the workforce mm -hmm. at different levels. You know, I think in a lot of ways through through our work both the tri-agency initiative and just the fact that the three of us happen to work really well together, we, we, we really, we have stopped looking at this as a pipeline of people into the workforce. People will plug into the workforce when they complete their education, but you, you don't actually ever stop your education. The, the way today's workforce changes, the way jobs change, the way companies and employers change those jobs, there's a constant need for education. But I, I think what I see happening, and, and I'm, I'm actually very optimistic for the state with regard to this, is, is both TEA and the Higher Education Coordinating Board seem to be finding ways for the leaders among their constituency to, to deploy the kind of flexibility they need locally to deal with their employers locally. So if someone's saying this is an important credential for somebody to have, it might not even be an associate's degree. It might just be something you can pick up in the first 12 months after high school or your senior year of high school. Yep. And I think finding ways for superintendents, community mm -hmm. college presidents, university presidents to really, the word exploit has such a negative connotation, but to really fully utilize the framework we're in. It's, it's legislatively, it's what we're bound by. Statutorily, it's what we're bound by. And we should be, but there's a lot of room for people to customize the experience for students for them to get that out of it. These guys have done a great job at doing that. And I think that what we want to continue to see is for them to find ways for even more of their constituency to participate in that. So um, just for one, it's, it's hypothetical, but it's a very real example. Yeah. If, if a student sort of expresses a desire as a freshman, sophomore, that they want to be an electrician, if you could complete an electricity CTE class your junior year, and you could start the first year of your apprenticeship your senior year, you could be licensed uh, as a journeyman electrician, which is the second license, apprentice being the first, two years after high school, and probably be making twenty, two, three, four dollars an hour at the age of twenty. And the upside potential for that to own their own business, participate in the economy more fully, and for their community to thrive as a result of that is good. We see that now 
in certain areas. What I think we're going to continue to see, and, and certainly if this is the leadership, you will continue to see more opportunities being given to the local officials to find things that work in their community and fill jobs in their yeah. community so we can create more. Um, I, I'm interested in metrics for success. In fact, I'm interested in the definition of success on this partnership. So it all sounds good, legitimately. And you all seem to be compatible individually. And your vision for what the mission of the combined work makes sense. And I, I mean, everything I'm hearing makes sense. How do we know that this is working? What, what, what does success look like? What are the specific metrics, Commissioner Keller, that tell me that you're doing a good job here? Because, because if, you know, what I heard in the previous session, it's good that you were in the room back there and didn't hear it. I heard a lot of smack talking about the performance of education in Texas, not, not from, you know, people who don't know, but from the former U.S. Secretary of Education, for instance. So what are the metrics of success? Well, so a couple of things. First, yeah. I'd say, like, if you look at our Talent Strong Texas plan compared to other, so we put some metrics down this week. Um, uh, and you compare that to where the kind of metrics we had before, the kind of metrics other states have. One of the things that's striking and the marker we put down in Texas is that we're going to take a market-based approach. So we're going to measure the value of credentials on individual earnings. Mm -hmm. So what we need... So we connect our data to uh, on what's happening in credentials, to what actually happens in, in terms of earnings and demand in the Texas uh, labor market. And what if we're successful, what we should see is uh, we, we should see a stronger talent pipeline uh, where more people uh, have a clear line of sight to good jobs that have a strong potential for upward mobility. Um, That's something we're only going to be able to see in the future, or what can we say about that? No, now? I mean we're talking about uh, we're we're talking in some cases about where we can see uh, making some rapid changes, where in um, in a matter of a couple of months, six months, a year or less, folks are able to attain credentials that uh, opens up new career pathways that um, uh, that can transform their lives in some cases, and. Uh, there's a ton of information out there. There are a ton of websites out there. Uh, they tended to be pretty siloed. Like one of the initiatives that we're working on uh, right now that I'm excited about is that we've been working together to dramatically modernize our combined educational workforce data infrastructure. Uh, that was accelerated by commitments that the governor and legislative leadership made. Um, and so later this year, we're going to start rolling out new dashboards by institution, by program, um, where you can see earnings, we can see student debt. Um, break it down by race, by sex, by income, by geography. And so that will be, that will be the way that we get a better sense. And then the, and then right. leveraging that data to an, in another initiative where later this year we'll be rolling out a single intake portal called uh, My Texas Future, where we curate advising tools uh, for adult learners, yeah. for uh, veterans, for students contemplating transfer, and for secondary students, so that they can explore the options. Get a yeah. sense, not just here's how I could get a credential, but how does that relate to job opportunities? Start to develop a plan and get that warm handoff to institutions. So we have, I think we've got a common vision of being able to knit this together, but also where you've got a better uh, experience for students and families to, so that they can make more yeah. informed choices. Commissioner Morath, I was complimenting you before we came up here about the accessibility of TEA's data, and I genuinely believe that. We scrape a lot of data that we present from your websites and we we appreciate the fact that we can go find it pretty easily and i think if you are interested in the trans transparency into how schools are performing that stuff is is all there if i were a lay person looking for one metric for success in your data set um, what would you recommend it be how would i know that what you're doing in alignment with the commissioner and with the chairman is actually working uh it's that's a great question um we have I don't know if we have enough copies for everybody in the room, but we have an annual report that we produce um, annually. It's well named. Um, right, yeah. The, the, That's how that uh, works usually. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, for, uh, Frank, if you're around, if we can pass some of those out. But um, there is a, um, uh, I'm going to get to your question, but uh, there, the, the first kind of key content page in there uh, is the waterfront of public education. Yeah. So it starts at kindergarten readiness. How are, where are uh, five-year-olds in terms of their, knowledge of the alphabet, their sort of basic literacy, basic numeracy, their, their development. 
then where are our third graders in terms of their proficiency? Where are our eighth graders in terms of their proficiency? Where are our graduating seniors, both from a graduation rate perspective and then how many of them are prepared successfully for uh, what comes next, college, career, military, whatever it is next. Right. And then we continue to track them until they're 24. And how many of our graduates at the end of um, six years after high school have obtained <clears throat> some sort of po a meaningful post-secondary credential. So this is, um, right. if you're looking for one measure that measures the entirety of the K-12 system, it's difficult because we have uh, kids for about 15 years right. from pre-K-3 through um, high school graduation. But uh, the, uh, we work in alignment. This is sort of an example of why, um, how you've seen alignment. The goal that we strive for is essentially the same 60 by 30 goal that the um, uh, uh, coordinating board formally adopts is the same sort of ingredient um, that you need for a healthy workforce in our diverse economy. So, so, if and I, so, if, yeah. so you can see the, the percentage right. of 24-year-olds that have obtained a post-secondary So, you know, we, we have published on our site for years the eighth grade cohort That's data right. where you take every kid who enters the, high, the, enters the public schools in the eighth grade, track them through high school, and then six years beyond to see how many accomplish some sort of credential. And, you know, it's a little better than it's been. Yeah, it's about 29%. But it's, but it's like, I mean... It's absolutely the definition of nothing to write home about, right? I mean, it's, yeah. I, 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 I don't take away from the fact that three in 10 is the good news, relatively speaking, to be anything that we should feel great about. Am I wrong in thinking that? I mean, it's, uh, so the arc of history is long. Um, and yeah, but we're all going to be dead before that number gets higher. Well, Come just on. to be clear, like, this number is actually as high as it's ever been. No, in I our know that, and that's my point. Like, Texas, where 3 and 10 is the good news, is also not a good bumper sticker. Yeah, I mean, our, our goal, are effectively, when you think about 60 by 30, our goal is 6 and 10. Um, yeah. So we need to uh, sort of double the current rate of uh, successful production. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, one of the things that you think about, if you're measuring 24 year olds, yeah. Last time they were actually in K-12 was six years prior. Uh, last time they were in kindergarten was quite a few years ago. And this is one of the complexities about analyzing the, the performance and improvement. There have been massive reforms uh, driving change in a yeah. positive way. You've got uh, uh, 80,000 teachers in Texas as of today have been uh, trained in the science of teaching reading and evidence-based reading practices in kindergarten through uh, second grade. Um, that has happened in the last three years, and we're, we'll have another hundred. We'll have 120,000 trained by the um, by the end of the next calendar year. Um, that's one of those things that will echo for years to come in terms yep. of the impact on literacy and in terms of preparation to living living a literate and productive life. But um, you know, the 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 joke that I use is if you work in public education and you're interested in instant gratification, like this ain't a good field for you. You have to move with a burning sense of patience. Because we can implement every reform with perfection tomorrow, and it'll take you a decade a to realize, yeah, to right, see right, the right. kids growing up in that system. Right. So uh, when you think about where we are with the current 24-year-olds, that's different than what, say, Burleson High School launched last year to create this massively awesome, blurred uh, post-secondary experience where they have a gaming academy, and the kids right. are you know, prepared to program like uh, every company in the world would want them to, to, to be. And so like, you won't, it take, takes a little while so to if I, So if I give you 10 years and we come back and have this conversation again in 10 years, and I suspect that neither of us will be in our jobs in 10 years, but nonetheless. I'd probably have an aneurysm by then, but yeah. yeah. Um, um, if, if you're at 29% in 10 years, you'll acknowledge we've not made sufficient progress in that. So what I would say is you got to think about leading and lagging indicators. So the current crop of 24 year olds 10 years from now are going to be the current crop of 14 year olds. Um, uh, 20 years from now, it's current crop of four-year-olds. So the, if I think about everything that you have to get right in order to significantly reduce uh, achievement gaps, to significantly raise um, uh, the level of literacy and numeracy, um, I mean, if you're talking about uh, Algebra 1 is this gateway, well, I mean, yeah. did, you, did you master arithmetic um, by the end of third grade? Because if you still have to do a lot of counting on the fingers, um, when it comes to cross multiplication, you have this tax, this mental tax on you. So there's, there's like a lot of stuff that has to be improved. Okay. We will see iterative improvement throughout every measure in the pipeline and in fact have up until the time of the pandemic. It's been a, we've been on a, 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 a significant upward trajectory up until the pandemic. Yeah. And with the reforms, the, with the infusion of resources, with the focus of the legislature, leadership of Lieutenant Governor, Speaker, Governor on this, we will continue to see uh, significant improvement. Um, but you know, the, the, the challenge is we have to get better faster than we've ever gotten better before. 
Um, and under, so, the, under the most adverse circumstances ever. So, so this, is, um, right. uh, this is the difficulty of this work. Um, uh, we're not, you know, we don't t t churn out widgets. This is not, we're not in the, you know, uh, we're not flipping houses. We're taking little bundles of energy and turn them into self-aware members of the Republic. That's not easy work. Yeah. Uh, Chairman Daniel, the, uh, what, if, if unemployment numbers, jobs numbers, are not the metric for success of this work, what would be in your mind? What, what comes out of the Workforce Commission that tells us that you're doing a good job? I, I actually, I'd have to tell you, it, it is the workforce participation numbers. It is that. that. Yeah, I, I, honestly, the unemployment rate doesn't tell you very much except what happened during one week and one I month. I understand, yeah. But more importantly, is if you look in real time at the way employers create jobs and the fact that they're creating new jobs and where they're creating them, it tells you a lot about your production pipeline of yep. people that you're putting there. You know, we, we were the first large state, fourth state overall, to recover all the net lost jobs, all right? And um, states like North Carolina, uh, states like Georgia, who, who had a fairly hot economy, Florida, pre-pandemic, they, they didn't recover at the rate we did. There's a lot of reasons why employers create jobs, why they put jobs in a certain place. The workforce is a large part of it. It's not the complete measure because there's, there's some business operating, there's, so there's you capital costs. You take, you take from the comeback of those numbers that we're doing an adequate or good job on workforce development? That was my next point, yeah. which is this. We, people who sit in rooms like this one, we necessarily focus on the ideal. What yeah. do we want this to be? But there's more metrics that, that we don't look at because People that sit in rooms like this one, we don't like the intermediate steps. We just want to get to goal completion. The ideal cannot be the enemy of being the best. We create jobs among the best, if not the best in the nation, sometimes the world. We can't let being the best be the enemy of taking the action that we need to take to right the ship. So, we have a tendency to focus on the ideal. The number needs to be this. And I think everyone would agree the number needs to be this. But nothing operates in a vacuum and everything's on the same economic continuum. If you are among the best at creating jobs, capitalize on the things you're doing well as we continue to push toward the ideal. Yep. I think we discourage practitioners at times when we only focus on the ideal and don't give them credit for, frankly, being the best there is right now. You don't have to accept even just being the best as what well, we want. The ideal is the finish line. But while you're leading the race, learn from your experiences as you're leading the race because they're going to give you good insights on how to all get right. to the ideal. Uh, my, we have about 10 minutes left, is that right, R roughly? All right, I want some questions from all of you. Again, you've got the commissioners up here. You've got the chairman up here. Fire away. Hard questions, please. Woman up here in the mask, I see you right there. Thank you. Anybody. My answer to you would be when we engage with an employer, particularly if they're looking for help from the Workforce Commission, uh, depending on the program, but for the vast majority of the programs, we're going to immediately start talking to them about raising wages relative to that program. So there's an accountability to us if you want our direct help, for example, on a skills development grant where you want to do right. some next level training to level up, you're going to have to build into that model an increase in wages for the employees that participate in that, and sometimes in the in entire workforce. It, it encouraged or mandated? Uh, we m will mandate it in some programs, encourage in others. It depends I mean, we on what we, we talked about this in the last, Chairman Daniel, in the last session that, you know, a lot of debate around economic incentives and the value of economic incentives and attracting business to Texas. And then the question is, since we have three people who are accountability oriented up here, 
are you holding the businesses that receive those incentives accountable in terms of job creation or in terms of wage creation? In terms of, uh, in, in terms of training and participation in, in that particular TWC program, yes, we would hold them accountable for that wage increase. Okay. Um, I want to rip, whip through questions just because we have a little bit of time and uh, you know, it's an opportunity to get answers from these folks. Um, to the panel, does Texas rely too much on importing talent and degrees instead of growing our own? This was a question in the last to yeah. to topic, Commissioner. Uh, yes. I appreciate you, you, you <laughs> honoring my desire that we go through this like a the end of a game show. That's good. Okay. Um, uh, again, to the group, once you have a clearer definition of credentials of value, will all three agencies share and use the same measure of value? And how will you apply that yardstick to your programs and funding incentives? Commissioner Morath. Would, would, would you tie funding to um, achieving that goal? Yes, uh, with an asterisk. Yes. Yes. Can yeah. you elaborate a little bit more? Well, so uh, we essentially already attempt to do this. We, um, uh, when you think the, uh, the accountability system for public education is really about setting goals for students, um, and we wish go uh, our students to be prepared for college, career, or the military. So we measure military enlistment, but for career preparation, there's a lot of credentials of value. Um, so as the coordinating board goes through a uh, research process yeah. to sort of define and align on uh, credentials of value, as the TWC looks at uh, labor market data, uh, determines sort of living standards and, and the like, um, that all gets incorporated into um, ours. I won't say it's necessarily 100% the same list because what you need right. for an 18-year-old is a little bit different than what you need for a 35-year-old. But, um, but other than the, the differences that one would expect because of where people are in their life journey, um, it would be essentially the same list. So you would fund on the basis of how successful the folks in your charge are at accomplishing these goals? Well, yeah, the way you phrase the question is, um, I can't say purely yes, because the school finance system doesn't uh, entirely... Well, well as you know, and we could role play here, you be you, I'll be any superintendent in Texas, and I'll say, why are you funding me based on enrollment and attendance? Why don't you fund me on the basis of what happens on the back end, not the front end? There you go. Right. Okay, and sure. would you agree with that? So we have, a, uh, we have begun moving in that direction. We think of House Bill 3, it set up several sort of uh, incentive-based funding streams that have been extraordinarily powerful and impactful. So you're coming out today for ending funding on the basis of attendance? Uh, no. Okay. So um, I'm just trying to clarify. We, yeah. uh, I'm, I'm, uh, but I'm a big fan of aligning incentives. Um, okay. yeah. So attendance is an interesting incentive because it encourages you to have children in school. Right. Um, which is generally a good but you thing. Know, but you know the gripe about that on the part uh, of I, Yeah, I, I, I recognize it. Yeah. If you're interested in reducing chronic absenteeism, a recipe um, uh, to do that is to not stop paying for attendance. Um, so the, 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 um, but you have other things. I want to make sure your kids are um, ready for um, college, career, and military at the out, um, uh, when, they're, when they're done. I want to make sure that, that your talent deployment strategy is focused on making sure that you give the uh, kids that are the neediest the absolute best talent. These incentives exist in Texas. They don't exist in a lot of other states, which is one of the reasons why we, have, we prior to the pandemic, we were beginning to trend in a, in a far more sort of aggressive growth area that you saw, than you saw other states. Okay. Commissioner, you had something you wanted to jump well, in. Well, I just wanted to add that, I mean, that we do in a slice of our higher education funding system do exactly what you were suggesting, Evan. We were like for our Texas state technical colleges are funded right. on the basis of the, uh, of the re it's a return value model based on increased earnings. Um, now, I would say in, in terms of aligning incentives, we've not done a great job uh, for, for our community colleges in particular on their workforce education programs. Um, so they can actually, they're, they're, there's amazing work and partnerships going on here at uh, Austin Community College, at El Paso right. Community College, uh, other colleges, but a lot of times it's in spite of those incentives that are present in the finance system where if they streamline their programs, if they if they, they're directly aligned with getting folks into the workforce quickly, they can actually lose funding from the state. So, so we have a community college finance commission uh, underway right now with the robust discussions around this. I'm going to propose that first the principle should be, can we stop punishing colleges for advancing the, the uh, needs of their communities in the state? Um, let me take one last question, Kristen. Is that okay? From a card here, and this is for Commissioner Keller. Any plan to allow nonprofits and intermediary agencies to compete for funding, for upskilling and reskilling, for outreach and re engagement of returning learners, 
I read on the Texas Tribune site this week that we may be having some problems with the reskilling efforts uh, in Texas. Um, or post-secondary access enrollment and success for graduating high school seniors. Any willingness to work outside with nonprofits and intermediary agencies to assist with that? Um, sure. We we're actually working with a ton of nonprofits and different inter intermediary organizations yeah. across dozens of projects right now. Um, some of these are more specifically designed to measure the treatment effects of different strategies so that we can bring that information back to the legislature. Um, some are more in the context of like enhancing our uh, data infrastructure long term. Yep. Um, you know, this is also something that our institutions um, and our university systems, I don't, I don't find them to be closed off to these kind of uh, partnerships. Um, so yeah, it's sort of a all hands on deck on, on these on mm -hmm. these issues right now. Um, I will say that as we, that especially, so we focused a whole lot, and, 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 and maybe it's telling that we focused a whole lot on the traditional pipeline from high school to college and that kind of thing. We are not gonna get there and achieve all these goals if we're just focused on that traditional pipeline. We've gotta serve many more people and educate them to higher standards. We're gonna be older than 34 in 2030. And so that's one of the reasons we put this marker down that we've got to better serve and, and be intentional about serving adult learners. And that's really, really hard work. Uh, so we've focused some resources, worked in partnership with colleges and universities, continue to iterate on that so yep. we can dial it in and, and better support the colleges and that work. That's not something that's generally been emphasized or, or uh, uh, you know, even spotlighted in these kind of conversations. Okay. Let's leave it there. Please thank Commissioners Keller and Morath, Chairman Daniel. Thank you all. Good. I enjoyed it. Thank you.